technical evangelists from Microsoft, Andrew Fryer, Simon, Simon May, and Dan Pilling. And they'll be explaining what an evangelist is and the importance of IT careers. So clap your hands for um, these three technical evangelists from Microsoft. Thanks, nice, guys. Oh, well, it kind of works. Is that on? I think we're is on. that Can working? Yeah, cool. OK, so um, as, uh, as we've just been introduced, we are not three technical evangelists. Um, I'm <laughs> Simon May. I am a technical evangelist. And I'm Andrew Fry, and I'm one of those too. And I'm Dan Pilling, and I'm not a technical evangelist. I'm a, a technical marketing manager at Microsoft. <laughs> but we've all had uh, careers in IT at some point. We all started out doing something in IT, and we're here just to kind of take you through why you might want to consider a career in IT as opposed to a career in anything else. And basically, it's because we think, well, basically it's money for nothing, isn't it, Andrew? As long yeah. as... And I, uh, I love it. I mean, that's why it doesn't feel like work for me. It's, you know, it's nine o'clock in the evening. Am I working? Am I working? Are you guys working? I'm, so, I'm being paid to stand here at the O2. How cool is that? How many of your mates can say, hey, I did the O2 last week? So I love working in IT. So it's great to love what you do, but it's also really good to have good skills to complement loving what you do. So that's equally important. And it's kind of good to have good skills. It's kind of good to love what you do. But does anybody have like a mobile phone bill or some rent or something? It's kind of useful to get paid, right? So it's kind of useful if your job also is something that generates some kind of income for you. Hopefully, a relatively good amount of income for you. And in fact, the sort of the intersection of all of these three is what we kind of think of as our happy place. If you're doing all of those, actually, life is pretty good. And that's the point at which, well, work becomes kind of fun, like this, really. Yeah, because you know what? I love playing golf as well. I'm pretty good at it. But you know what? I just didn't make the Ryder Cup team last year, you know, for example. So any two from three doesn't kind of work, yeah? yeah you can end up doing something for, that you're good at, that pays well, but then you spend all your money on toys to cheer yourself up or parties because life is so boring at work where you spend 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week sometimes. So that doesn't work either. No, nope, it doesn't. Absolutely not. So you want to be in the happy place. So, Dan, your happy place. Yeah, so I thought I'd introduce myself a little bit more. So my name's Dan Pilling. I'm a technical audience marketing manager at Microsoft. And in particular, I'm responsible for the IT Pro market in the UK. Um, I've been at Microsoft for nine years, but my career in IT has been about 13. I started off as an IT manager for a group of estate agents. I then went from working for estate agents into sales, and then finally saw the light and joined Microsoft as a marketeer. Um, so, in particular, I now look at IT pros and, and market to that audience. When I talk to my friends who don't work at Microsoft and they ask me what I do, it kind of, they get the impression that I'm partying all the time, and that's not true at all. Are you if sure? You would, uh, occasionally, but not, not that often. I think that's just my Facebook profile, you know? So if, we, if anyone was to ask my mum what I did, she would say, well, he works in computers, but that's about it. That's all I know. Um, if you ask society what a marketing person does, generally you'll get a response that says, they do a lot of stuff with PowerPoint and lots of triangles. Um, but that's not what I do either. If you speak to my customers and say, well, what does Dan do? They get this impression that I'm kind of doing film shoots all the time and working on really exciting campaigns, and that's not necessarily true either. What I actually do is take an understanding of a technical audience, take an understanding of our technologies at a technical level, and then form strategies in terms of marketing to achieve outcomes. Um, so that's actually what I do. In reality, that's translated to working with IT pros in the UK uh, and helping them develop their skills uh, and become more knowledgeable um, and also have a great time doing it. But Dan, sometimes the wheel comes off. What's your worst day at work, buddy? So my worst day at work is probably a few years ago I had booked an event where I had a very, very senior person from Microsoft. I think you may be able to guess who that might have been. Did he have hair? Um, no, he didn't have any hair. Much. He danced. <laughs> He loves developers. Quite into developers yeah. He's quite good at dancing like a monkey as well. <laughs> anyway, he was due to come and present to some of my senior customers. So I have all these senior customers in a room, similar to yourselves. I've got about 10 minutes to go before he's due to come in, do some dancing, maybe shouting developer, developer, developer a lot. Anyway, I get a phone call. He's had a problem with his plane. 
And basically what that's meant is not going to turn up. So that was probably my worst, worst day at Microsoft. The way I overcame that is I actually got the customers talking to one another about some of the challenges they had. And I actually started networking, and it, it turned out really well. But that was probably my worst day at Microsoft. But that's an exception. That's definitely not the rule. So Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I kind of wish I'd listened to what my dad said. Don't ask me what he said, because I didn't listen. But apparently he did something in computing back in 1963. And we just had the head of Raspberry Pi out here. Was anybody in that session? How, many, how much RAM has a Raspberry Pi got? Yeah, so my dad had 2K, and it took up a room. So I thought it was all pretty boring. So I did something completely different. What my friends think I do is they look on Facebook and they see me at the Opium Lounge in Barcelona at 9 o'clock at night, and I'm working. There's a photograph of me working with my nice graphic equalizer T-shirt on. My mum gets the same kind of idea. She knows I like science fiction and Star Wars, so she thinks I've joined some sort of dark side kind of thing. A lot of people I talk to think that people who work for Microsoft are a bunch of mindless robots. Fair to say? You haven't met anybody from Microsoft before, perhaps, have you? Any of you? As you can see, we're quite different. <laughs> when I go to events, I tell people I'm an evangelist, and my surname is Fryer. I don't know if you've picked up on that. My Twitter handle is DeepFat, because it's Fryer spelt that way. But if you're going to do a gig in Nottingham, why wouldn't you turn up as Fryer Tuck? Trouble is, of course, people thought I was the Dark Lord of the Sith. You can't help buying monks' costumes on eBay, I guess. What I actually think I do is try and change the way that we do stuff, because the way we have done stuff when my dad was alive isn't going to work anymore. We face a whole load of different challenges, which we're going to come on to in this talk. So I like talking about what the problems are and how to overcome them. There's no point just painting doom and gloom, you know, we're warming up the planet. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to fix it? How are we going to face some of the challenges that, that you guys are kind of come up against when you start your professional careers? So what I really do is work with these gentlemen. They put up with my awful jokes and we try and explain how to get the most out of our technologies and how to get stuff done at scale in the enterprise in data centers because it's about engineering, it's not a science project, okay? This is actual work, people rely on this stuff, you know? Planes fall out of the sky, nuclear reactors break down if our stuff doesn't work, literally, okay? Simon, it's a pretty similar story for you, I guess. Well, it is, but before we go there, what's the, what's the worst day that you've ever had at work? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. So when you've lost a customer's operational database with all their customers, sales orders, purchasing history, stock for the last two years, you're in a bad place. Now, I learned two things. One, it's really good to have a backup. Two, it's really good to own up. And owning up is about going to the, your manager and saying, I fucked up. Are we allowed to say that this time of night? Probably not. Yes, yeah, after 9 o'clock, it's okay. Okay, <laughs> right, we're after the watershed. Good. So I made a mistake, and I went and told my manager I made a mistake. And honesty actually is valued in the IT industry. It's one of the great things about working it. There's a lot of trust going on because we're all experts, and we, we trust each other's interdisciplinary skills, and we get on with each other. So I was able to recover the situation much faster than if I tried to cover it up, and we we're in a good place. Not perhaps the best place, but a good place. You don't have those kind of problems, though, did you, Simon? No, I didn't have those kind of problems. So, um, again, you might be starting to spot a theme here. Um, what do people think I do? Again, if they look <laughs> on Facebook, they appear to think that I seem to go to a lot of parties. It's a bit odd. Um, I don't quite understand why that is. I think it's mainly because every time I do something like this, there's somebody goes out into a room and fills it with glow sticks before they um, let me go on stage, which I don't really quite know why, but thank you very much for doing that. Um, <coughs> what, what my mum thinks I do is kind of close to what I used to do which is um, looking after, well, people's IT, really. That's where I started out. It's where I started my career. Um, I started out doing desktop support, and we'll go on to a little bit around that a little bit later on, but that's kind of what my mum's vision of me still is, and it's never been uprooted. Um, what, do, what does everybody else think I do? What does society at large think I do? Well, I think probably look after some sort of data center. I don't. I know what they smell like. If you've ever been into a data center, they all smell exactly the same. Um, but I don't go into them very often unless I need to go and take a picture of a server to use in a presentation. Customers kind of think I do this, but on a smaller scale in a white room. Um, one of the odd things about uh, this job is that we were doing this kind of presentation thing earlier and trying to work out whereabouts are the most interesting places that we've ever presented. This is quite cool. We're in the O2, but we've done um, 
we're from Reading, obviously, so we've done the Medeski Stadium down there, done Old Trafford, you've done the Emirates. Um, Wembley. Wembley, Wembley was quite good. Um, Bernabeu, Ajax Stadium. Brands Hatch. Re yeah, um, so there are some <laughs> nice places to go. But generally people don't see that. They expect that we just go and sit in a white room and present to people and show them how technology works. Again, we don't really do that. We do a little bit more. Um, we're trying to make things a bit more interesting. I, however, love what I do, which means that I think that I'm playing all the time. I think that every time I open up a laptop, build a server, spend 20 hours creating a demo that then doesn't work, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> that's, I was just a bit weird like that. So, you know, those are the kind of things that I do. What I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis is sit there and do a lot of hard work. I make virtual machines. I stand up servers. I take three laptops, turn them into a data center so that I can take it out on the road with me to show people how this stuff comes together. That's what an evangelist does with their day-to-day -day job. They take the technology, try and make it more useful for people, show them how they actually get to use this stuff. So, I think before we go on, let's find out what your worst day ever was. Yeah. My worst day at the office. Um, career okay. limiting move, Simon. <coughs> Come on, My you know worst the day at the office, the career limiting move. Um, I used to work for a bank. Uh, banks are really good at one thing, making lots and lots and lots of money. They get really pissed when you stop them from making lots and lots and lots of money. You're giving count here, aren't we all the swear words in this presentation? Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, <laughs> I was uh, just doing some stuff one day, um, going in, working on some some servers, and um, this particular set of servers that I'm working on happened to be a load of credit card processing servers. Just happened to be near Christmas. You can see where this is going. Um, I kind of took us into a little situation where we were kind of losing about two million pounds an hour. That's not nice. It's also not nice when you are your own manager, so you have to go and turn around to a director of said bank and say, um, one of our guys kind of made a mistake and we're now kind of losing about two million pounds an hour in revenue. Is that going to be okay if we leave it overnight? The answer there is no, and you do a 36 hour day. However, off the back of a 36 hour day, um, I kind of, I learned a lot about how not to do creative things with servers that are in production um, <laughs> that actually have two million pounds worth of transactions running through them at any one time. It was quite a good day as it turned out. Um, it did quite a lot for my career from a, uh, um, an improvement point of view after the fact. However, that particular night wasn't the best night of my life, has to be said, but it recovered. So we've been doing IT for a while some of you are just entering your IT career, so we thought it'd be quite good to have a look at what's changing the way we work in IT today. There's presentations all around this theater. We don't hear Microsoft mentioned too much. Take it away, Simon. So I guess there's, there are three major changes, and we'll go through each one and explain what we mean by each one, and we'll drill down into them in a little bit more detail as well. If I was to ask you guys how many devices you've got right now and hold them aloft, you probably couldn't because there's probably more devices in your pocket, especially if you are one of our student ambassadors. You've probably got five or six in your pocket at the moment. So <laughs> it makes it kind of hard to show people. What we know globally as a market is that various devices are exploding in their, um, in their different levels of usage. Obviously, uh, the one that grabs the headlines all the time is smartphone usage. We are about four years ahead of smartphone usage figures as to where we thought we were going to be as an industry. We thought we were going to have shipped about yeah, half a billion devices now, or have half a billion devices in use. We're up to a billion. So if you follow that curve through, we reckon that within about the next two to three years, we were on the three to four billion devices in use point. That's really important to understand from an IT point of view, because three to four billion devices means three to four billion devices connecting into networks. So that's extra networks to manage. It's extra amounts of bandwidth to manage. You've also got to do something with all of those devices inside of an IT organization because it's not good to lose a device that's got all of your customer data on there. And lots of people think, oh yeah, but my phone doesn't carry customer data. What if your phone's got your customer contacts on it from your sales organization and somebody loses their phone? You need to be able to do something as a company to fix that because actually in the UK and um, around most of Europe, you have um, requirements to be able to do something with that device under data protection laws. 
it is a, an absolute legal requirement. We don't think about it as consumers every day. We don't think about the fact that somebody needs to be able to do something with that. But how would you like it if you are working for, you are a customer of a bank and the bank manager loses his phone with all of your personal contact details on it? He's actually going to be a target because he's a bank manager. So he is actually an active target for somebody to go and pick him off of a train as he's getting off and go, you know what, I'm going to put a uh, golf ball in the back of a sock, hit you over the back of a head and steal your phone because that phone has got 500 customer details on it. We have to think about that as IT folks. How do we deal with it? So from a device's point of view, it's all about managing lots and lots of different disparate devices. And in fact, you can't do it. There are too many devices to manage. You need to manage the person, not the device. And those people are changing, aren't they, Dan? They are very much so. So not only have we got this explosion of devices, um, but for the first time in history, we have three generations of people working. Each generation works differently, potentially, has different expectations about what they require from IT, and has different ways of working. So we have devices, we have people, but there kind of needs to be something that kind of brings all this together, Andrew. What would that be? Well, it's this cloudy thing, buddy. Um, I, have we had any presentations on cloud here today? Silence. It's a great way of turning off uh, technical people because it, and we, we want to spend a bit of time talking about it because it's important to understand it. But clearly, if you've got five devices, having your data on one of them and not on the other four is not brilliant because oh, those photos are over there. Well, I don't want them over there. I just want them on the device I'm going to pick up. And by the way, I'm going to refresh my device. We change our phones like some people change their socks at Microsoft. My 925 arrives tomorrow. God knows when I'm getting my 1020, probably the week after. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, and I don't want to keep fanning around. I just want to turn it on, tell it about who I am, and say, Here, where's my stuff? Show me my stuff. And it's the same with these. If this falls in a fish tank in a demo I saw recently, I just want to be able to turn it back on, get going, and get working. And I don't want to have to track all the way into Reading, which frankly is appalling. I know you guys live there, but I live in Surrey. Um, I don't like crossing the county line. I don't want to go all the way there just to go and get stuff. I want my stuff available to me. So that means it's got to be somewhere else. And that somewhere else is on massive data centers sitting behind the internet, which is what the public cloud is kind of is. You all consume it. You've all got email on your phones. Yeah, You're all using cloud services. If you've got an Xbox Live account, you're using our services. If you're using Hotmail, you're using our cloud services. Office 365, perhaps if you're in the commercial world. Now, I don't want to make a plug for Microsoft, but clearly, if you went over to Dublin and you drove just down the road from our Dublin data center, oh, look, there's one, and it's got an Amazon badge on it. Oh, and there's one with Google on. Curiously, in the same place, which might, you might, what's so special about Dublin? And we're not talking about capital gains tax. We're talking about environmental conditions, before you asked me. Um, so the cloud enables us to get people and devices connected properly so that we can collaborate and work anywhere. We can include people who want to work part time, perhaps because they're caring for a, a young baby, an elderly relative, perhaps because they're disabled, perhaps because they just hate hitting the motorway at 8 o'clock in the morning like everybody else does and rather come in at 10 and do some email at home and then go in for those meetings and then get out before the rat race begins again or we'll drop the kids at school when they're a little older. Yeah. So we've got all these different work styles going on. We just need to be able to consume our content and work as a team because, you know, we, we live in a world where we're social beings. We're not like termites, but we work as a group of people, different generations, different work styles. We need to collaborate. So cloud services enable us to do that. So to wrap it on, but if it wasn't really important, we wouldn't be spending 70% of our R&D budget, so that's 5 to $6 billion a year, slightly more than we pay for our phones, um, just to do that stuff. And we design everything in the cloud first at Microsoft, okay? So you're gonna see that software is up there before it's available on here, okay? That's kind of where we're going. That's our big bet. That's why the share price hasn't gone through the floor. That's why we still get our checks every month. So I think there's quite a few misconceptions around cloud. Um, there are indeed, Dan. And if I talk to my friends who are not working in IT, and you say to them, what does cloud mean to you? And they say, well, when I go and buy my new laptop in PC World or Comet, I get a lot of storage free that's up in the cloud. And that's what cloud is. Cloud's all about free storage for me with my new laptop. So my dad used to work at the, if you're from the UK, you might know the Met Office, that computer. So my mum thinks that cloud computing is how you work out whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not. 
from a marketing <laughs> perspective and as a marketeer, cloud really is a way of pulling together a number of technologies or solutions and actually wrapping it into something that can be seen as a concept and can be marketed out in terms of messaging. Um, so, so from a marketing perspective, it's kind of a buzzword, but there is stuff that fundamentally comes up to help with that buzzword. Sorry, I completely zoned out <laughs> so there with all the marketing, marketing um, stuff. So um, what do companies think of it? Well, companies kind of think that um, the cloud is all sorts of different things. They just kind of pull all these words together and they just don't know, just don't know um, what it really is. So that's kind of what, part of what we do in that. Andrew knows a little bit more about what the cloud is. He is the cloud guy. So you think it's based on some definitions or something? Yeah, you know, we have standards for the in internet, don't we? You know, IPv4, IPv6, it's a standard. We have a standard for HTML. We have a standard for this, we have a standard for that. Guess what? We have standards for clouds too. National Institute of Science and Technology defines a cloud as something that's scalable, elastic. You get paid per usage. You just don't buy a capital asset. You pay as you go in the mobile phone parlance. You also um, have it delivered to you over the internet. Okay, so those are the three core, there are a load of other characteristics. So I know what it is. The challenge, of course, is explaining that to other people, which is kind of what we do. And actually, I just want to dive in here and say something about this picture that we're showing. We're showing a picture with loads of servers, with loads of lights. We buy a lot of servers. We have the lights taken out. <laughs> because those lights generate, well, their cost of electricity that we just don't want to pay. Why have the light there? We don't need it. We've got remote management software. Yeah. So, to so from a technical yeah. point of view, that's not actually a good cloud. That's just a marketing Yeah, it's picture. a very early okay. picture of an early data center. So put that into context, Dublin data center. Say it's got si we define a data center as something that's got more than 60,000 separate computer rack computers in it, OK? 60,000. If you can save one watt, that's 60,000 watts. That's a lot of watts. What we've learned doing this is that we are now charging you, not on the basis of the software that's in here, not on the basis of how much we paid for all those servers, but how much power we're using. So if we can use power efficiently, we can charge you less. It's not about the HR costs either, because we've got, in this data center, we've got 50 employees, and 25 of those eat pedigree chum. For the Brits in the room, that's dog food, because they're the Alsatians guarding the perimeter fence. There's 25 humans in there and 25 guard dogs, pretty much most of the time. Okay, so it's a very light touch. So who's looking at those lights? Nobody. No disk drive. The only thing that gets thrown away, the only bad renewable story is no disk drive leaves that data center. They get smashed to pieces because we haven't found a reliable way to wipe them. So no data leaves the building. There's a component, a replacement component for every single thing that's in there sitting in a rack somewhere. So an engineer turns up, I've come to fix, blah. He goes into the storeroom, the part is there for him. Okay. So it's a very, very serious operation. But the key thing is, for us as, as technical people, is we don't need to be in Dublin, much as I love the rain, the weather, the high prices, and, and I'm not a fan of Guinness. I can work anywhere on this stuff, and so can you, providing we get the internet things sorted out, and 4G and stuff, you know? We're in a good place. So actually, this is an opportunity for anyone looking to move into IT. Um, and it's not only us kind of standing up here, kind of evangelizing it. Uh, Manchester Business School recently did a survey uh, of organizations in the UK, and if you do a search for it, you can find it quite easily. And three things that came out from that. So the first one was that organizations in the UK recognize the need to investigate, adopt, look into these cloud technologies. At the same time, they recognize they didn't have the skills in-house necessarily to actually utilize and make great advantage of it. And then finally, they looked into all the university courses in the UK and felt there was a lack of uh, technologies being taught that could help embrace it as well. So there's opportunity within industry and there's not enough teaching around it. So there's an opportunity there for individuals to go and investigate further uh, and take advantage. Yeah. I, I, mean, I had a look on um, an EU website and pulled some report numbers up. I couldn't get to the number, but I worked out from detailed analysis of this really badly written European Union report. There's 100,000 IT job vacancies in the European Union as I sit here today, right? So we need people. It pays well. The only question is, do you enjoy doing it? Now, I can't make you enjoy doing something any more than my mum can make me enjoy Brussels sprouts. But I'm just saying, okay? 
So what does it take to get to be an IT professional? What are the kinds of skills that we need to, to see that the industry actually coming up, out with and, and starting to grow, Andrew? What do, what do you think we actually need in terms of those skills? Well, what I think um, is we need to be absolutely very, very lazy. When my dad was doing computing, this big computer, 2K around, there was an army of about 50 guys swarming all over it and it cost a fortune. It was one computer, essentially. had one processor in it and some memory. So you've got 50 guys managing one computer. In this data center I just showed you, typically we have one IT guy managing 200 physical servers. Each one of those is maybe running 10 copies of the Windows operating system. That means to be, you need to be very light touch on each one of those devices, so you need extreme automation. So as a developer, and perhaps some of you are thinking about a career in dev, what you actually start doing is what we call DevOps, which is the business of designing code to automate provision of services. For example, you can imagine that there's going to be a rock concert here next week, and the, or you, you guys will come to stay here, and you don't like the food here, and there's a Domino's pizza down the road. They know about the gig. Wouldn't it be really good if their internet ordering system stayed up while the gig was on, and they could cope with the demand? But the rest of the time, during the week, there's hardly any events on here. They don't really need to do anything in this area. So we need to scale stuff up and predict that. Now, smart software development will sense the system's under load and start tripping it up. And more importantly, scaling it back, because remember, you're paying per use. So if your next idea, the next Facebook, the next Twitter takes off, you want to use a cloud service to deploy onto it so that it grows as your idea grows and you're only paying for what you use. You haven't got a big capital cost to soak up at the start of your investment. All you've got to do is write the software. You haven't got to worry about the tin because we'll do that for you. So those kinds of skills of extreme automation and writing scalable software are what we need, in my and humble opinion. And you've, you've hit the nail right in the head there with the DevOps thing. DevOps is nothing new. No, no, my dad was doing it. Your dad was doing it. Yeah, I was doing it. When I talked about the, um, the thing that I was doing for the bank that was actually costing £2 million an hour, the way that we got out of that, um, and this was back in 2003, um, the way that we got out of that situation was those 36 hours that I put in, I actually put in live recoding that system. I used to do um, IT in a way that meant that I was writing scripts that would allow me to fix things. And what I was able to do, whilst those machines were up and running, we noticed that after about 15 minutes or so, the services on them kind of got a bit full and they kind of started falling over for no reason. We had no depth debugging in place there, so we could have no idea of what was causing the dumps. We just noticed that the servers just kept falling over. So I started writing some, some code against those systems while it was all running live um, to just check what was happening. We were doing port checks. I was literally checking to see, were all these ports up at any one time? Did something start to go down? Yes, it did. Okay, we started to notice that there was a, a chain of events that was occurring. And that chain would start off that um, a certain port would die. And then the server would start to put some stuff into RAM. And that RAM, uh, that, the, the stuff that was going into RAM, would just start to fill and fill and fill and fill and fill and fill until we got to the point where the server was basically out of RAM. But it wouldn't fall over at that point. Nothing actually happened there. What actually happened was that stopped the server from being able to talk back to the back-end database. This was a three-tiered system. So as a result of that, the database then stopped hearing from this machine. And it kind of thought, yeah, I'm not quite sure why I've stopped hearing from that particular machine, so I'm just going to stop talking to it. And it was the fact that it had stopped talking to it, because it had stopped talking to the database, that then caused another bit of code in there to go, oh, the database isn't there, I'm going to fall over. So after a while, we worked out that there was a way to get around this, which was to watch for the port going over, and then just think, actually, the port's gone. Right, it's now time to kick off a graceful restart of that server. Server restarts take on average about 15 minutes just to reboot the server because there's a whole load of disk stuff that goes mm -hmm. on there to, to wake the machine up. If we hadn't done that very important piece of DevOps work, those machines would never have come back. We would have lost that service for more than the, um, the 36 hours that they were down for in total. Well, you have somebody sitting there with a switch who goes like that, <coughs> like Homer Simpson in the cartoon it's thing. You press the red button every hour or so. so you don't really want to be working at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's, it's okay funny working that you should say that because he was called Andrew. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Um, he, uh, yeah. No, he actually was. Um, yeah. So this is back in the day. Well, this, this, this still happens. Mm. There was a couple of guys who were played to, um, to do shift ops. They yeah. sat there all day in there. 
And what those guys actually have to do is not sit there and reboot a server. That's not their job. It's their job to make sure that the, um, that the backups happen, that somebody moves the tapes in and out of the servers. Mm. So the knock-on effect is if they're actually rebooting servers every 15 minutes, you also don't get backups of all of your servers because somebody else's job couldn't get done properly. And that's the reason why we have this idea of being able to do DevOps, being able to live code against this stuff. And why being able to do that in the cloud is very cool. Because if that had been a, um, a cloudy system, instead of us having to wor worry about getting those servers rebooted very quickly to keep the service up, we could have just added extra capacity to it. Mm. We would have continued to fix the problem, but we wouldn't have ended up in a situation where those servers were falling over all the time, we kept losing those services, and for 36 hours we kept losing two million pounds of revenue an hour. That is a very bad situation. It Chaps, is. Yeah. Some thoughts I've got. So I'm thinking about moving into a career in IT. Yeah. Do I go really specialised on something that is super focused? Well, I can't believe I just said super focused. I'm turning American. Yeah, you are very American. Um, or do I kind of breadth my knowledge and, and kind of start thinking about, you know, maybe one or two technologies? What do you think, Andrew? Well, so I started off in database design. Well, actually, I started off in. I started off at art college because <laughs> uh, my dad did computing and you know I, that thing about me not listening to my dad, I didn't listen to my dad. I used the computer paper that he kept bringing home and drew all over it. So I got quite good at drawing, but I needed a job and, I was, and then I ended up doing an admin job that I really hated, but then somebody gave me a computer. I thought, wow, this is amazing. So the DNA kicked in and here I am. Um, but I did, first of all, I did um, military intelligence, which I'm not going to discuss here really, pretty boring stuff actually. Um, but then I did um, criminal intelligence, which is really interesting, which is going out with the police on raids, like you see on CSI, and hoovering up disks and stuff. But this is back in the 90s, when it was a very, very different world that we had now. We had more than one word processor. I know we have nowadays, but let's face it, Word is a pretty ubiquitous format, and even if you haven't got Word, you can open a Word document with something. Fair to say? Because it's HTML now. Back in the day, you had four or five different really good word processors out there, from Lotus, from WordPerfect, from us, a few other people. And so you had a disk full of stuff, and you didn't know what you are going to find. We had much more, uh, many more different operating systems and databases, none of which were designed to talk to each other. So it was really hard. But I became gradually a data expert. And then when uh, we got outsourced and the government decided they didn't want any technical people working for it, I then went contracting for a while and got into business intelligence, which is the business of like being a personal trainer for business, understanding how to make a business lean, mean, and fit, or whatever objectives it has. You know, so you have a set of goals. This is, we work out how we measure what those goals are uh, using IT, and then we make sure that we're actually, um, actually performing properly. Because it isn't just about looking, chasing profit. You'll rapidly go out of business if you look at profit. You want to look at other things as well. Are you retaining your staff? Are you investing in R&D? Are you talking to your customers? Those kinds of four things might be a good place to play. So I did a bunch of stuff around that. But then I realized that I needed to learn some other stuff as well. I needed to understand performance because this stuff had to work really quickly because you want to be using these tools at the speed of thought. Financial analysts and stockbrokers don't want to be waiting around. They want queries back straight away. So I had to learn about networking. I had to learn about security because this data was key to the business. It was the IP of the business. This is how this business operated. So it had to be secure. It had to work over the net. It had to, I had to work really closely with a whole bunch of other people. And I think the other thing I, I learned, Simon, is I needed to get a bit closer to the business. Yeah, well, that is critically important. It has to be said. You've got to be able to, um, to talk the same language of the business because that's where you start to bring those things up. You, found, you said earlier on about the, um, the idea of a pizza company where they know mm. that people are going to be ordering more pizzas because this place happens to be full um, <coughs> or going and getting more drinks from the bar so they want to order more from the bar. So all of that kind of stuff, it's very important to, to know and understand um, mm. what people want from you. One of the things that um, I've done throughout my career is I've actually... Um, made sure that I've had a level of certifications around the work that I do. And that's something that um, no college or university was ever able to give me back, back when I did it, which is a, a massive mm. 11 years ago. Crikey, 13 years ago. Ooh, that's scary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, can't add up. So, um, yeah, I, I did this whole thing uh, as part of my career of getting certified on various bits of technology, which, back to Dan's question, meant that I did go in for some levels of specialty around the place. And that was very important because that level of specialty gave me the money to do the other stuff, frankly. That's where the, uh, where the funding came from for me to be able to go off and, um, and play with other more fun things. If I look back at the way that my career actually took place and worked, I started off um, 
going to university off the back of having done a work placement where I was doing actual IT. I had an actual IT job. And um, during that actual IT job, um, I was doing lots of rollouts and all that kind of stuff. What that exposed me to, though, was a group of guys who were earning a really good salary. And the reason they were earning a good salary is because they'd gone out and got the understood what the, what the business was looking for that they were working for. And the business that we were working for needed certifications in order to be able to actually qualify for the business that they were going and pitching for. It's actually a minimum requirement in certain industries. So as a result, I knew if I got, went and got the right certifications, I'd always be employed. So I went back to university, did my computer science degree there, and <coughs> whilst I was learning about VAX20 operating systems, anybody worked on the VAX20 operating system? It's a Hoover, isn't it? It is a, yeah, it's a Hoover. Yeah, no, no. Um, so actually, VAX20 isn't an operating system. It is a mini computer, but, um, and it runs VMS. But the uh, essence of that was I was learning about an operating system that was already out of date, which was utterly pointless to me going into univer leaving university and going and getting an actual job at mm. that point. So I thought, I'm going to go and get certified. So I did. And I worked through um, a long certification path, which meant that when I came out the other end of university, I was able to um, go into a job and get a reasonable salary. But I would say that it was very important that I'd learned about VMS. Because going through my career, I've needed both things. I've needed the industrial certifications as well as a great ground, grounding in computer science. Because yep. now we talk about things on a fairly regular basis, Andrew and I, mm. um, <coughs> around virtualization. And that's what powers all that cloud stuff. There's a whole lot of virtualization there. Abstracting away from the... Um, the kind of the hardware level mm. into the software level, which is far more flexible. Around that, I have to know about how disk subsystems work so that I can make sure that the disks can be moved around happily. I have to know about things like gang scheduling and free time scheduling on processors. Those are really important because people will come along and ask questions about how does gang scheduling work and how does free time scheduling work yeah. on a processor. So those things, having that actual academic knowledge as well as the um, uh, the kind of industrial knowledge has helped me all the way through my career. And it's made sure that I was able to be constantly employed. I've never had to be yeah. going through a period of unemployment. So I did mine the other way around, Simon. I, I did my um, vocational qualifications first and then realised that I needed an academic qualification. That moment for me was standing up in the old Bailey saying I'm an expert in computers. When you, you, know, you stand here and I, you've got the Bible and the whole thing, the guys with the wigs on and all that. And I thought, you know, I really ought to have some sort of academic qualification in IT. So I managed to blag that out of my employer, and I was very lucky. So wouldn't suggest you necessarily do it that way around. But the vocational thing, I think one thing I would add, Simon, is if you are doing those certifications, it keeps you up to date with the latest tech. Even though maybe your current employer isn't using that tech, it's good to know what's out there because then you are a trusted advisor. And when some random sales guy turns up from Microsoft, you can either say, yes, I know what that is, and we definitely want to do that, or that is just not for us. And it doesn't work, and we don't like it, or whatever it is. But you're doing that on a basis of scientific fact, not on prejudice. Because this is business, not a science project, really. It's about engineering, making things work reliably, as I said before. So some resources for you, I think, as we perhaps wrap up, gentlemen. I think we've forgotten a subject. What's that? Marketing. Oh, that. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, it's easy to forget that marketing thing, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Come on, guys. Yeah. Give me a break. So, quiet, actually. <laughs> so in this new world of working yeah. in IT teams and IT departments, yeah. how important is marketing those organizations? Hugely. Essential. Absolutely essential. In fact, we often say that marketing is too important to be left to marketeers. You've all watched the IT crowd, have you? Yeah? Yes, we'll get a few laughs in the room now. Yeah. So, you don't really want to be the pariah of the organization, the weird guys in the basement, the only phone, absolutely, if you have to, because they've got annoying personal habits and they don't really know what they're doing. What you really want to be doing is being invited to the party. When we're going to go and do something, like open up in a new country or, or implement a new internet presence, you are front and center of that decision-making process. Maybe you're even making the suggestion yourself because you understand the business and you have contacts inside the business. So you need to actually brand up like Dan is here and get yourself some t-shirts for your IT department on, open the doors up, let people come in for coffee to fix their computers rather than hiding behind some CCTV system or being at the end of a phone. So get out there and, and what, because if they can't see the IT department, the IT department can be somewhere else in another country, far, far away, okay? And then our jobs are at risk because they don't see the value of you guys doing IT inside an organization. All right. 
you personally or your team? So it's absolutely essential. It's one of the funny things as well around IT is that you get this very strange level of access to people inside the organization. One of the things that I can always remember um, doing is, is actually sitting down um, with the chief financial officer of the bank that I once picked, a uh, ba bank that I once worked for, um, and helping him to pick out lighting sockets for his room. The switches, literally. The switches for his house that he was going to install. Because he thought that was IT. Yeah. But I didn't change that opinion in his head. No. Because I wanted him to be the person that comes to me every time he wanted to know something about IT. The fact that a light switch has nothing to do with IT didn't really matter. But the marketing was, I'm the guy who knows how to make the electric stuff work. Which meant that I kept getting jobs, strangely enough, inside of the organization. Yeah. So you've got to market yourself, your boss, and your IT department. That's sort of roughly that order. That way the checks will keep coming in. So practically, if we look at the skills. Yeah, so first of all, how do we get on in terms of getting our hands on with this technology? So if you're a student, then um, there's a program which is up there called DreamSpark. Uh, it's a free program. You get access to, is it pretty much every technology we do? Pretty much, yep. All the technologies. Yep. Yep. For free? Yep. And cloud usage, I believe, as well, for free. And cloud usage. Yep. So if you're interested in that, come and see our guys on the stand tomorrow. The guys with the, there's, there's the Windows 8 ambassadors here. Mm -hmm. They'll get you set up with the code. You can get free access to the software. And it is much better than Bit or anything the software, and then having the police come around and tell you. Well, yes, yeah, those, those, you dodgy, have been doing those that. dodgy um, mm. additions you get to software sometimes. Yes. Some people, of course, actually like to learn differently. You know, you've just got your new Lumia 920, or Paul's trying to use my camera down here, and is worried about all the knobs and buttons. Maybe he wants to ask somebody or watch someone else use it before he uses it. So we have this virtual academy thing, which again is free. We're not trying to flog you anything. But if you want to understand what cloud is, what technology is, even the basics of networking and fabric, how stuff gets fitted together, you want to learn how to write professional software that doesn't break. Yeah, I know I work for Microsoft, and I just said that. But we do actually do quite a lot of risk and proper testing and um, secure development lifecycle. There's a whole load of stuff going on in there. Uh, of, of courses and labs that you can try out. You don't, so all you need is a device to connect to the internet to consume that. Yeah, we don't care what that device is. So how do you get onto that? Well, that's free. You just type in Microsoft Virtual Academy into your favorite search engine. <laughs> Very hey. happy. Yeah. But um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it probably works on Google, but I don't think you'll get as good results. Um, so the other thing as well, um, I'm going to do the certification thing because it worked well for me, and I think it's the best yeah. tip but that I've got, really. Yeah. Go and get certified. That is probably going to cost you some money. You will probably need um, some books, and you'll have to pay for the exam. So that is going to be a little bit of a cost, but it is going to be well worth it. You put the investment in, and it turns out to be useful And, we, in the and end. we've got the maths behind the numbers. It, it's a much better payback than tuition fees, actually. Mm. You know, you spend maybe 100, 200 quid, maybe 500 quid, maybe 1,000 quid to go and get a high level of certification. And within the first two years of you working, you're going to end up seeing 5 to 10K each year in your pay packet. That's good ROI. Okay? I can't discuss you doing a degree in IT. I'm not sure what the payback is and so on. But that's what our research indicates about our certification. And of course, every, indus every industry player like ourselves and our competitors have these vocational qualifications that do mean something and add value to your CV. They might just get you an interview because that's the bar that gets you to the table like your degree does. But if you really know what you're doing, you'll be able to articulate beyond that. I think the other thing it also forces you to do is learn stuff you didn't know you needed to know because you're going to follow a syllabus. You might think you know something about Windows, but you don't until you do one of these exams. And then you'll really know about the stuff that Simon knows, which means that he's off to America in a couple of months' time, earning shed loads more cash as he gets sucked into the Borg. Mm. Yeah. It is Microsoft. <laughs> so you like parties, right? On Facebook, I on do. On Facebook. You like parties on Facebook. Yeah. I like parties on Facebook. I noticed there was a bar outside. <laughs> so I think we're going to go and hit that in yes, a second Yes, that's a good plan, time. yes. However, beforehand, were you able to do the thing with the, the thing? Excellent. So treasure before hunt. we go that, yeah, there's a treasure hunt. Who's got a Windows phone? Excellent. Okay, so, <laughs> so you guys aren't allowed to find this then in that case. Um, somewhere in this area, there's a badge underneath a seat or something or in a cup holder. Maybe the cup holder like to your right. Red. Hopefully there's someone's a badge. got one. In a, in a cup holder and one of the seats, there is a badge. And we don't know where it is. It might not be in the one you're hey, saying. Hey, have you got it? No. Oh, ah. Okay, you just got a bag. Damn it. <laughs> we need <laughs> a badge. A so, so you've got to find it. It's got to be out there. You can win. 
We are giving away a seven billion dollar phone. That's what we paid for it yesterday. <laughs> hey, 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 there we go. Here you go, sir. Seven billion dollars worth of phone. So, <laughs> so before we wrap up, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, it's the diagram. This this works on absolutely everything, not just IT, but absolutely everything. In order to find your happy place, you need to take something that you love, something that you're good at or can get good at by learning, and something that earns you money. So on behalf of the team, thank you, and uh, we'll see you in the bar. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, does anyone, just for you guys, go, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Top. Okay. Andrew? Uh, how, macro, how Microsoft see the future of cloud computing? Uh, how Azure can fight some giants like Amazon Web Services? Who services? Amazon, how Amazon Microsoft Web see the future of cloud computing? Um, I would love to share. Do you want to? I'll do it. Um, so, on. yeah. <coughs> how do we see it? Um, well, cloud is probably the. Um, one of the biggest growth areas that you can see. And we actually don't think that everybody is necessarily going to go all cloud. We think there are some really, really awesome workloads that need to be in the cloud. Things like doing websites, great in the cloud, really handy. Some things are not as appropriate. So, for example, if you're in, um, in the UK, and I'll take my own example, and you're doing banking, or if you're doing health, sometimes allowing that data to actually be off-premises is not a good idea because there are legal requirements around that. So what we think is a better plan there is to build a hybrid. So all of our solutions actually have hybrid built in from the ground up. So if you take some code and you want to go and deploy that to our Azure cloud, which could be PHP, for example, take some PHP, go and deploy that on Azure, you might think, OK, we can do that. We can scale that up, scale that down. There's this component, which is also written in PHP, Exactly the same PHP, because it was exactly the same dev team that wrote it. But we don't want that to be in the cloud for some reason. And it could be around you know, risk of losing IP or something like that. So they might think, OK, let's put that on premises. And the way that our cloud solutions work, you can do. You can deploy exactly the same code in exactly the same way with exactly the same tools, monitor it with exactly the same tools, on premises, off premises, however you want to do it. Everything is built to, to do both. Frankly. Yeah, so my, my, my take to you is give it a go. It's a, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Oh. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm a little confused because I'm here. Thank ah, you, Andrew. Um, you came here to uh, Archimedes states that is the open source, the network, and the security. Three people from Microsoft. And Andy started uh, speaking about something uh, related with the Raspberry Pi that is boring. And I'm very confused. And you are coming here to open source state to say that the Raspberry Pi project that is a very good project, that is trying to have a uh, computer science in UK and in other third party development countries saying that it's boring. So that is a little confused for me that you can hear and you say that. Uh, so we are now in the open source and you were speaking before about cloud. I wanted to know what is your thought about OpenStack and how Microsoft can compete uh, with OpenStack companies. Thank you. Yeah. It should be. Try that. Let me shout out this a minute. Is this, is this work? Can you hear me okay? So, what I. Okay, so. Let's, what, what is it you want to be open source? If you, want the, if you want your code to be open source, you want to write in PHP, you want to run against a um, MongoDB kind of style NoSQL database. You give us your code and we'll run it for you. Now, yes, we're going to charge you to run it because even OpenStack are going to charge you for the compute and the power and so on. It's got to run somewhere. It's physically got to execute on a server. So all I would say is on our, on our Azure platform, you give us your open source code and we'll run it for you. If you want to run 8,000 VMs running um, Red Hat and you want to run them in your own data center and you want to virtualize them, we won't charge you for that. You won't have to pay Microsoft any license fees. If you so, run them on a Microsoft platform. Yeah, if you use our virtualization platform, you don't actually have to pay us for it. Bizarre, isn't it? So you've got your 8,000 um, highly available, clustered, 
Red Hat virtual machines, if any one of them goes down, we'll spin it up on another node for you, will charge you to manage those virtual machines because we think you need good management software so that if you write a piece of code and it crashes, we can spin it up, we can decide, tell you that something's going wrong before it goes wrong because we can peer inside, say, with something technologies like BeanSpy and tell you what's going on inside that code and we can make your code run efficiently. Now, there is a point at which you are going to pay someone for something. It would be great if everybody worked for free. But sadly, we all actually would like to pay our mortgages and we'd like to drive cars and we like going on holidays. Maybe you want to buy your wife a nice ring. So we get paid for software. Now, I work for a company where we sell our software. And, we're prof and, and because of that, you have a throat to choke when things go wrong. You phone up Microsoft, you give us hell. So if your Red Hat VM isn't running properly, on our virtualization platform, you can ring up and shout at Microsoft and raise a support incident and we'll get that fixed for you. Work with the Red Hat community. And we'll do the same for Suzy, CentOS, Ubuntu, and a few other distros that we see being widely used in industry. Because this is about industry. This is about running professional organizations, whether they are governments, banks, schools, hospitals, and so on, at scale. Now, at some point, someone wants to charge for their software. If you write a program, I guess uh, you're going to charge somebody for it. Is that fair? Do you think that's fair that you should? Yeah. I'm trying to answer your question. I'm not trying to get my head around the question. Why are we on this stage? If that is your question, I have absolutely no idea. This is where I was told to come. Um, and if we could run the world on Raspberry Pis at one or two watts and use gazillions of them, then maybe one day we'll get to that and we won't need a Microsoft. Maybe there is a world after Microsoft. But what I am saying is that if... Microsoft earns one pound in the UK, we reckon that nine pounds 72 is earned by software developers and infrastructure specialists in the UK, by the companies and services that they provide and knock on. So actually us being here is good for Britain. Okay, which is why we don't tend to get beaten up in the press about some of the stuff that other companies I could mention that are theoretically closer to open source are, okay? I'm talking about 872,000 people earning a living in the United Kingdom as infrastructure specialists and another two or 300,000 people earning a very good living as developers on the .NET platform. So what I'm saying is we're doing this for a living. It's our job. It's a profession. And we're engineers. And we're just saying that's what we do, okay? Open source is another approach. It's a whole other argument. We've had that, had that for years. All I would say is... Judge us on performance, judge us on facts, make your own decisions. But do that on the basis of scientific analysis and economic analysis rather than on prejudice. If you come and get a job at Microsoft, I don't care whether you've got grey hair like me, long hair like her, no hair like, says he looking around somewhere, <laughs> where you face when the sun goes down, your sexual preferences or any of that stuff, I just want to have a conversation with you on IM rather like at a Turing test and if you've got it to go then you can come and work with us and I expect the same kind of approach to people when they're selecting software and solutions for business. So I think we have another question over here somewhere. Is there a... If you have a project... Actually it can work. No, go on. Um, if you have a project uh, and the client wants it done really quickly, is it best to chuck, uh, say, 100 people at it, or is it best to, say, get a really small group of people to work on the project and say to the client, look, it's going to take us a little bit longer because we want to have a small number of people doing it rather than letting a larger number of people doing it and saying maybe not being able to talk to each other or... Okay, so this is a classic problem of software design. And when I was doing... There's a brilliant book. I don't know if you've read it. It's probably still valid today. It was written about the IBM three, System 380. This lady's laughing because she knows I'm going to talk about the mythical man month. Gentlemen, ladies, how long does it take to make a baby? And how, no matter how many people we put on the project team, it takes that long. So I think actually... <laughs> You can move things around, but putting extra people on a project that's already started work, and I've had some experience of this, having worked for the government, I'm sure you have too, Simon, is never, ever a good thing. You're much better to either cut functionality and deliver on time or slip the project and do it right. You know, we all go into a restaurant, you know, undercooked meat is never good for anybody, undercooked software doesn't really work either. And I know I'm saying this talking for Microsoft, and we know that equally we are getting better at this. Now, cloud 
expertise is making us much better because we deploy to the cloud first, so everybody's on the beta program. Everybody who's using Office 365 is already using the latest version of Word or Excel. They're testing it for us. So when it goes out on media or as a download, as an ISO file you can download, it's actually working a lot better. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time. The rest time. is in the bar. Okay. But um, thank you very much. The guys at Microsoft, everyone. Round of applause. Thank you.